Thanks to AG for sponsoring this video. 1610, Castle Chahite, Hungary. In a small Hungarian village, hundreds of girls are going missing. People do not know where their children are going, but some say that a wealthy woman of the elite is responsible. Rumors say that she's been kidnapping children, draining them of their blood before killing them as part of a sadistic beauty ritual. This dark story is believed to have inspired the horror novel Dracula, who bites the necks of humans and drinks their blood so he can live forever. Now, whether or not that's true, this specific method of finding eternal youth landed this real-life vampire a spot as one of the most prolific serial killers of all time. This is the disturbing tale of the Blood Countess. July 2014. Your boy Jacko goes to the allergies to see whether or not he's allergic to cats, so they put needles all over my back, and not only was I severely allergic to kitties, but apparently fruit. Yes, every single fruit. And guys, when I was a kid, I freaking loved strawberries, but I was sick all the time. Since then, I've mostly just eaten meat and cheese and Flintstone gummies to kind of compensate, but guys, this is not enough. I absolutely hate vegetables. Celery makes me violent, and fruit in its raw form makes my lips swell. But lately, I've been drinking AG1, and it feels so good to have all the nutrients I need, and I finally have my energy back. It's helped me to get back in the gym, stay focused while I work on these videos for you guys, and honestly, it tastes pretty good. I've got my friends hooked on this stuff, and if you guys want to try it out, hit the link in my description and they'll send you a free supply of immune-supporting vitamin D3K2 and five travel packs for free with your first purchase. Guys, you seriously can't put a price tag on your health. I mean, just ask Elizabeth Bottery. Well, maybe she took it a little too far. Anyway, let's get back to the video. Elizabeth Bottery is born into wealth or nobility in the Kingdom of Hungary. Her father, George IV, is a baron and her uncle, a voivode, or King of Transylvania. And she doesn't just get her royalty from her father's side, because her mother Anna is the daughter of Stephen Bottery, the King of Poland and the Prince of Transylvania. If you couldn't have guessed by now, Elizabeth's family is super rich. They own pretty much everything. Hungary, Slovakia, the majority of Transylvania, these guys are one of the most powerful families in Europe. And all this money allows for Elizabeth to get an education, something that's not easily attainable to most people in this time period. Unless you're loaded. And because the Botteries fit into this category, Elizabeth is soon wildly intelligent and speaking several different languages. But despite her wealth and power, Elizabeth grows up a pretty sick kid diagnosed with epilepsy at a pretty young age, which gives her frequent violent seizures. Some say the illness is due to inbreeding, and that would make sense because her parents are first cousins. And during this era, there are some pretty strange treatments for the illness. Like you could give the sufferer the blood of a non-sufferer and smear it on their lips. Now, does this lead to Lizzie going twilight mode later in life? Well, it's hard to tell, but this is her first documented taste of human blood. Elizabeth grows up to be a beautiful girl, garnering the attention of pretty much every boy in sight. But because she's one of the most prestigious bachelorettes around, it's not like she could swipe right or left on just anybody. Think of this kind of like Entitled Tender. To keep her family's ranking, they have to find a suitable boy to help her carry on the legacy. Also throw in the fact that Elizabeth doesn't get to choose the guy she's with, instead she will have an arranged marriage to keep the bloodline secure and pure. When Elizabeth is 10 years old, she's introduced to Count Ferenc Nadeshti. He's a decorated athlete and soldier, but not a scholar like she is. However, Ferenc does come from a well-off family, and soon enough the two are engaged and Elizabeth is whisked away to live with him and her future in-laws in their castle. The massive, gothic-styled home rests in the heart of the Carpathian Mountains of Hungary, and this thing is surrounded by pretty much endless land. So while Ferenc, who serves as a military commander, is off away at war fighting the Ottomans, 
Elizabeth is left home alone. And it's around the same time that she becomes pregnant, but not with Ference's kid. It's a guy that doesn't come from a rich family, which may sound normal to you and me, but at this time, this shit was a scandal and he was called a lowly peasant boy. Elizabeth's forced to give up her child to some family friends, and if this isn't bad enough, the baby daddy is castrated and thrown to a pack of wild wolves. But this little affair doesn't delay the wedding arrangements, and Elizabeth and Ference get married in 1575. And the wedding is a rager. More than 4,500 people attend the event, which lasts for three days straight. Now, since Elizabeth's family is technically more influential, she gets to keep her last name, and Ference is forced to change his to Bottery. Still though, the union of these two prestigious families makes them a true power couple of the day. Unfortunately though, the lovers don't get to spend a lot of time together at the beginning of their marriage because, well, war. But Elizabeth manages to keep herself busy by tending to their numerous estates, managing all their properties, and overseeing the staff. But in the rare times where she and Ference are together, they bond by mistreating their servants. And when I say mistreat, I mean they literally build a chamber in the castle specifically for brutalizing young girls. They find being evil to their staff members to be quite entertaining, and Ference is soon spoiling his bride with many disturbing gifts. He gives Elizabeth a clawed glove to scratch up the servants with, and the couple even gets an Iron Maiden, which is a large cabinet with steel spikes inside, to impale people with. These two spend the majority of their time coming up with sick and twisted ways to hurt the help. They burn them with hot iron, stick needles under their fingernails, and cover them in honey so their flesh can be eaten by insects. Good times. And when they're not engaging in this morbid role play, the pair somehow finds time to have five kids. But after 29 years together, Ference dies in 1609. And at this point, Elizabeth's behavior starts to become erratic and even more macabre. She is about to make things a whole lot worse for her victims. The 44-year-old starts luring poor girls to the castle with promises of work, but when they get there, they are subjected to unspeakable acts. Elizabeth then forms a team of tormentors to help her tie up the girls and render them helpless. They take turns sinking their teeth into their victims before mutilating their bodies with scissors. I can't really talk about everything they did to the girls, but in one brutal beating, a bit of blood splatters onto Elizabeth's cheek, turning it a bright crimson color. Elizabeth becomes obsessed with these blood baths, which causes more and more people to die in her quest for eternal youth. But as countless girls start vanishing after they go to her castle, no one really does anything. See, because these women are servants, people don't really care. This, paired with the fact that Elizabeth is a rich countess, makes her untouchable. See, after years of killing peasant girls, Elizabeth doesn't really have anyone to help her out with her estate, so she's forced to go to more quality victims in the year 1610. She also sees their blood as more valuable, with the blood of noble women being the most. And to her, this discovery is a game changer, but it will ultimately lead to her demise. When the rich kids start disappearing, everyone notices. No one can ignore the rumors now, and the people that are important have their eyes set on Elizabeth. The Hungarian king, Matthias II, can't turn a blind eye any longer, so he sends one of his lieutenants to the Bottery Castle to check out what's going on. There he uncovers a gruesome scene. Dozens of bodies are strewn about the manor. He finds a few partially burned in fireplaces, and some are half buried in the ground with arms and legs still sticking out. The floor is saturated in red, and littered with barbaric looking torture devices. This evidence, along with the testimonies of over 300 witnesses, means that Elizabeth's reign of terror has come to an end. She's immediately arrested, and the four people who helped her are executed on spot. But since she's royalty, Elizabeth gets special treatment and even has a private trial. 
and in it, the judge finds her guilty of 80 murderers, with the true number being unknown and possibly much more. Legend has it that in her diary, Elizabeth wrote down the names of all her victims, meaning the death toll could be up to 650. To put this in perspective, Dr. Harold Shipman is listed as the most prolific serial killer in modern history, and he only has 218 victims. But despite all the carnage, Elizabeth isn't put to death. She's basically put on house arrest and forced to stay behind the walls of her luxurious castle until her death in 1614. It's important to note that historians still argue whether or not these crimes are fabricated as a way for jealous royalty to steal her land and property. Unfortunately, so is the division between poor and rich in our society and how each receives justice in our legal system. I'm Jack Neal, and as always, don't drink blood, YouTube.